Hello, welcome to the Seascape Ecology Research Group's video, which is intended to tell you all about the research that our scientists do on coastal seascapes and the nursery habitats they provide for marine animals. So stay tuned for a journey into our underwater world. Fish nursery grounds are critically important in the life cycle of fishes. Many fishes found on reefs and in the surf zone as adults have not spent their entire lifetimes there, but first use nursery grounds such as seagrass beds, mangroves and seaweed as protective habitat in their juvenile phase before later moving or migrating to their adult habitat or home. Nursery grounds have abundant and suitable food for fishes, provide protection from predators and wave action, and need to be connected to the habitats that fish are found in as eggs and larvae as well as adults. These habitats need to be protected from harvesting, destruction and other pressures like pollution to help maintain the populations of fish we rely on for food and income. Along the south coast of South Africa and bordering the city of Quebecha is a large coastal bay called Algoa Bay. This bay is full of marine life which includes dolphins, whales, fish, penguins, small microscopic animals, corals and seaweeds, just to mention a few. This makes it a really diverse and interesting coastal ecosystem. Many people enjoy the benefits of these coastal resources through fishing, tourism or simply by enjoying their time at the beach. And all of these benefits rely on marine ecosystems that are healthy and well taken care of. Examples of important nursery habitats include seagrasses, mangroves and seaweed. Seagrasses are underwater flowering plants that occur in extensive beds or meadows in coastal sheltered waters. In South Africa, because our coastline is not very sheltered and we get lots of wave action, seagrasses are only found in estuaries where rivers meet the sea. Mangroves are a group of trees that grow in the tidal part of sheltered coastal waters where very few trees would be able to survive. In South Africa, mangroves are also only found in estuaries. And then seaweed is a type of multicellular algae rather than a plant that lives in the sea. All of these habitats provide 3D structure for the baby fish to hide in, live in, and also a place for food to grow and live. Unfortunately, Algoa Bay and its important nursery habitats are under threat from the activities of many people that sadly do not care for the environment. For example, Many fishermen do not always follow fishing rules and regulations. Fishing pressure can severely deplete fish stocks, especially for certain species that are large and slow growing. Adult fish stocks are further affected if their young offspring cannot survive to become adults. With pollution and litter being big problems faced by young fishes in their nursery habitats in Algoa Bay, this gives them little chance to survive to become adults and add to fishery stocks. Wastewater and sewage also flows into our rivers and coastal waters, causing pollution that is harmful to the seagrass nurseries that are common there, and ultimately this is harmful to marine life. People also litter on beaches and nearby areas adjacent to the coastal nurseries. Marine animals accidentally eat plastics and other litter, and this litter can also smother and damage sensitive habitats like seagrass and seaweeds. These threats need to be addressed, not only by scientists, but also by society, in order to conserve our precious marine environments and marine animals. In Algoa Bay, we are lucky enough to have two of these very important nursery habitats. We have seagrass beds in the Swartkops estuary and seaweed-covered reef in the western corner of the bay in an area called Flat Rocks. We have a team of scientists and student scientists who are working to uncover just how important these two nursery areas are for juvenile fish. Our results show that both seagrass and seaweed are critically important nursery grounds for lots of fish that people catch later in their life when they are adult fish. These include species such as Cape stump nose, blacktail, zebra, strepi, as well as grunter. Our student scientists are now going to tell you all about their exciting projects in the bay. available to baby fish at flat rocks and what they are eating. In my study, I worked out how much food for baby blacktail and strepi fish is at the reef in Algoa Bay called Flat Rocks. Flat Rocks is the seaweed reef past First Beacon on Marine Drive. I collected samples of different types of food that young blacktail and strepi eat. 
I use the food samples to calculate how much food of different types there is for the baby fish at Flat Rocks. There are three main seaweeds, microalgae and invertebrates in the reef. In the laboratory, I worked out what the fish were eating. Blacktail and Strepi both eat small amounts of seaweed and invertebrates and eat a lot of microalgae. The Flat Rocks Reef has a lot of food for baby fish and the baby fish need reefs like these to grow into adults. My research is looking at how macroalgae reef structures provide necessary function to fishes by mapping these habitats and recording the juvenile fish that occur there using remote underwater video systems. In the case of the fish, the fish is in the water and the fish is in the water. The fish is in the water and the fish is in the water and the fish is in the water and the fish is in the water. Wazi za kimu zukula lwa sedu anje inlanzi ezi sinu ngana zifumana indawu yuku kusele kakunye nukuzi. In my research, I have observed that more juvenile fish and a greater diversity of fishes occur in complex habitats than in those with less complexity. Izi fundo zifumana se ukuba uko ingana ba edi pezulu luku sinda kuindawu zukula la inlanzi ezi sinu ngana ezi nsoko tileyo kuna lezo zinga nsoko tanga. Zi kwa zindawo zi nsoko tileyo zi azivumela inlanzi ezi sengi nana ukuba zikule zibezi inlanzi ezi ndana kwa ye zibuyele emanzini anzulu zi okongeza inani ku inlanzi ezi zikulile. Nga pande kwa ndawo ekusele kileyo inklobo ezi ninzi zi inlanzi zinga bekeka emi mepegwe. To protect the fish that we eat and the fish that we love let us protect these valuable habitats. My study looked at what food items were available for young fish to eat in the seagrass habitat of the Swatkops estuary. Seagrass beds are an important habitat for fish and invertebrates as they provide lots of food for them to eat and protect them from predators. The Cape Stub Nose is an important fish species that uses the seagrass habitat and eats the microalgae that cover the seagrass leaves. The seagrass leaves were covered with diatoms for the Cape Stub Nose to eat. Diatoms are single-celled microalgae that have cell walls made of silica. The Cape Stub Nose also feeds on invertebrates in the sediment of seagrass beds. These include crabs, mollusks, prawns, shrimps and polychaete worms. Some species of invertebrates that were abundant in the seagrass beds included the Paleomon shrimp, the marine gastropod tick shell and salt tolerant snails. The number of diatoms and invertebrates available for the Cape Stubnose to eat in the seagrass habitat differed between seasons, but the actual food items they were eating remained the same between seasons. Black tails are a medium-sized oval silverfish with a large black spot at the base of their tail. They are omnivores, which means they eat both plants and animals, and their diet includes seaweed, seagrass, starfish, urchins, snails, limpets, and mussels. They are highly resident, which means that they rarely leave their preferred home region, and juveniles are commonly found in rock pools. They are also known as dassy, white sea bream, and cool stag. They can grow up to 45 centimeters long and weigh 3 kilograms and they have been aged to be up to 21 years old. How do scientists know where animals go and what resources they use? They watch them. But what happens if an animal moves too far, too fast, or is in an environment that is difficult for researchers to follow? How do they know where the animal travels or what its home range is? For that, researchers rely on telemetry technology. Telemetry transmitters are electronic tags that are placed in or on the animal and continually send out a signal that can be picked up by a receiver tuned into that frequency. The signal from each telemetry tag is unique so that the researcher knows which individual has been located and where it is. With enough locations of enough individuals, for example, a researcher can build a map of the species distribution, 
identify the individual home ranges and migration patterns, and compare these with other information such as locations of food, shelter, or human activities. For example, think of trying to track a leopard. These big cats are very good at hiding and often only become active at night. So to be able to know where the cats move, researchers might put a GPS collar on them and then be able to track them and see how far they travel and where they prefer to rest. This gives scientists the information to be able to say which areas are important for leopards. Similarly, tracking fish movements can be difficult because of the environment that they live in. Telemetry technology is very helpful for this, and we are using it to see which environments and habitats are important for blacktail and cape stump nose. We put little tags in the fish and then place telemetry receivers in specific habitats in the sea. As the fish swims past that receiver or takes a rest or feed, the receiver picks up the signal of that specific fish. We can then see which habitats they choose more often. It is important to know this kind of information as it tells us what kind of habitat should be protected so that the fish will have a nursery area that will allow them to grow and be part of the bigger population. Into so long, yes, that is a book as a balega with sea grass in a macro algae as fish necessary habitat. Seven is a mini stereo remote underwater video systems. Easy grass is simply shake guyo is a swat corps and then macro algae is simply shake guyo is a flat rocks. From a total of 24 overall fish species recorded in both habitats, six species were common between the two habitats, two species were only recorded in macroalgae habitat, and only five species were only recorded in seagrass habitat. There was no significant difference in relative abundance of overall fish recorded in these two vegetated habitats, but species richness was significantly higher in macroalgae habitat. Both habitats were dominated by juvenile fish species, with seagrass and macroalgae having 73 and 71% of juveniles, respectively. Macroalgae had slightly higher average juvenile relative abundance compared to seagrass, but the difference was not statistically significant. This simply means both habitats are important for baby fish, and they are very important as nursery habitats. Thank you very much for listening to our video from all of us in the Seascapes research team. We hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye.